Praise the Lord. Lead us, praise the Lord. Once again, I welcome you to our leaders' development session tonight. And I pray the Lord will open our eyes to see and make us to know where the enemy is coming from and whatever corner, whatever crossroad, anywhere the devil is coming from, we'll put him under our feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name because you brought us together to open our eyes and to make us see and to make us know what we ought to know. We pray, Lord, every challenge, every evil, every trial, every temptation against any of your people, your servants, you make everyone more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. We will overcome. We have overcome. And we're going to maintain our victory in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reading from Matthew chapter 26. And I'm looking at verse 41. Matthew chapter 26. Verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We're familiar with that verse of scripture. I just want to remind you that Peter was not expecting a word like this. He didn't see any temptation. He didn't see any trial. He didn't see any challenge in front of him that he could not overcome. He had thought about the challenge of facing Christ, of following Christ. And he had made up his mind he was going to follow Christ until the end. And even when Jesus said something was around the corner, he couldn't imagine that anything will ever happen that will make him fall into temptation. What is temptation? What's temptation? How can temptation come? Look at that again. Watch and pray. That she enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter had a peculiar temptation. It wasn't the normal day-to-day run-of-the-mill temptation. How many people, they're looking at this direction and they're thinking, temptation is going to come from there. The tempter is going to come from there. And so they watch this area and then the temptation comes from another direction and they're not prepared that's why many people fall into temptation without even knowing any temptation is taking place leaders have peculiar temptations in Luke chapter 22 I read from verse 31 Luke chapter 22 Verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, to tempt you, to possess you, to have you, to take you away from me, and then to make use of you, that she may seem to you as wheat. The word to see you as wheat is like when you crush the wheat and you seed the chaff and then take the real wheat. The Lord was saying to Peter, Satan, I'll be looking at you. 
and he wants to take you, have you, and sift you as wheat, so that everything you have learned, everything I've taught you, he'll sift you, and he'll take everything away, and your natural weak strength, weak flesh will remain, and you will be crushed, you'll crumble. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith should not fail. That's what the devil intended. The temptation to make his faith to fail. The temptation to make the old time fear to come up in his heart again. The temptation to think of death instead of thinking of life and resurrection. The temptation to think that Christ is taken and Christ is gone and to forget that Jesus said, I'll be taken, I'll be betrayed, I'll be crucified and die on the third day. I will rise again. And then the temptation to forget, unto you I give the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. He wanted Peter to forget the power he had, the privilege he had to sift him like wheat. And then take the real sin away from his life. And leave the child to be burnt in fire. But Peter never understood and when jesus said i prayed for you that your faith fail not and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren verse 33 and he said unto him lord i am ready i don't need to pray i know my heart i know my decision i know my conviction I am ready to go with thee both into prison and into death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny thrice that thou knowest me. Tonight I'm looking at the word with you on grace for victory over leaders' peculiar temptation. Grace for victory over leaders' peculiar temptations. Leaders must know that there are temptations that are peculiar to them. If we are ignorant of this, we will be defeated without even knowing or recognizing any temptation will be presented to us. Having victory over obvious temptations, normal temptations, the ones we talk about and the ones we have been thinking about. Praise the Lord, I have victory over that, I have victory over that, I have victory over that. Having victory over obvious temptations may still leave us wounded under subtle temptations. That's why discernment is essential for victory. Discernment is essential for victory. Grace for victory over leaders' peculiar temptations. Three things we're looking at. Number one. The variety of temptations of leaders and laborers. We're leaders. He has chosen us to be leaders. We're laborers together with God. And we who are leaders and laborers together with God, there are temptations peculiar to us. Point number one, the variety of temptations of leaders and laborers. Point number two, Vigilance against the temptations of teachers and trainers. The devil knows that a lot 
belongs and a lot is going to happen through the teacher and those who are training teachers and leaders and pastors and so he comes to them from corners from angles they never expected vigilance against the temptations of teachers and trainers point number three victory you'll have the victory victory over the temptations of pastors and preachers pastors and preachers strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter overcome and destroy the pastor and the pew will be emptied but it's when you have victory as a pastor victory as a preacher that this church I don't mean this people like Bible church alone the church the church of Christ the church of God built on the solid rock while Satan and the enemies come from here and there the church will stand and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church victory over the temptations of pastors and preachers point number one the variety of temptations of leaders and laborers variety different kinds temptations that come that many people are not even thinking about number one the temptation to compromise the temptation to compromise we come to exodus chapter 32 moses had gone to the mountain top and he left the work in the hands of a leader the next leader to him at that time exodus chapter 32 verse 1 and when the people saw that moses delayed to come down out of the mount the people gathered themselves together unto aaron and said unto him oh make us gods which shall go before us for as for this moses the man that brought us up out of the land of egypt we know not or what not what has become of him the point is this aaron did not see any temptation aaron did not fight against any temptation aaron did not recognize that the whole nation that had been delivered out of the bondage of egypt that were going back to that same bondage aaron did not see that god was going to reject and throw away disinherit all of israel the whole nation was still and aaron said unto them break up the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me when moses was around if anything happened moses and aaron will fall on their faces they will pray and in every challenge when moses was there he will turn away from the people he knew how to overcome the demands and the pressures of the people but now aaron was there alone he didn't see any temptation to compromise verse 4 and he received them at their hand and fashioned each with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf and they said these be thy gods o israel which brought thee up out of the land of egypt this is chapter 32 in chapter 20 thou shalt not make any image and refer to that image as your god 
Aaron fell, Israel fell, and God was about to destroy them. Look at verse 9. Why don't you back up to verse 8? They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten cow and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, This be thy God, so Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax against them, hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. In verse 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, Aaron did, the whole of Israel did, they fell into temptation, without even knowing that any temptation had taken place, I will blot him out of my book. Number two, the temptation to quit. The temptation to quit for a leader, Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. And when the going is tough, when the heat is on, when the challenges are multiplied, and when the leader, he must stand alone at a, at a particular time, when the leader stands alone and there is nobody to support or help, is uh, you know if you are just looking at temptation towards women temptation towards this or towards that you miss the point the temptation to quit when they go in is tall we're looking at numbers chapter 11. in numbers chapter 11 i read from verse 10. then moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled, kindled greatly. And Moses also was displeased, unhappy. We've been in this journey for so long. We're getting near our destination. And you see all the miracles that God has done. And you're still acting like babies. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Moses, it's not God that made them say what they said. When temptation comes and you don't realize, when people oppose you and you don't realize, when the road is rough and you don't realize who makes the road to be rough. Look at Moses, wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all these people upon me? Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them? that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. Wherefore should I have flesh, whence should I have flesh to give unto all these people? For they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. If thou deal thus with me, tell me then, tell me out aloud. Moses, of all people, and the Lord had appeared to him. 
and I showed him, you're going to lead the people to the land that flows with milk and honey. He said, I gave it up. Ministry, I gave it up. The calling, I gave it up. The way forward, I don't know about that. I give it up. Kill me, I pray thee. I ought to find if I have found favor in thy sight. Give me that privilege of dying now. That's what was saying. Let me not see my wretchedness. The temptation to quit. To quit. That's terrible. Number three. The temptation to yield under pressure. Number three. The temptation to yield under pressure. You see, as a leader, the followers do not all have backbone. They do not all have staying power. Staying power. The power to stay there, the power to endure. And the power to wait for God. And so they will put pressure here and there. And there's a temptation to yield to such pressure. For Samuel chapter 15 verse 24. For Samuel chapter 15 verse 24. And Samuel said... And Saul said unto, si unto Samuel, I have sinned. I didn't know this was going to lead to sinning. I didn't see the temptation when it came. But now I see, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words because, tell me, tell me, tell me. Say it properly. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Great temptation. But people don't understand. You're given an assignment by God. And you know what to do. And you are prepared to do it. And you are people you gather together to follow you to the battlefield so that you will do what the Lord has called you to do. And then, instead of leading the people, the people are leading you. Instead of telling the people what to do, the people are telling you what to do. And what they are telling you to do is contrary to the commandment and the charge that you've got from the Lord. But the temptation to fear the people... And the temptation uh, not to be able to go on in the path of duty. The temptation to yield under pressure. Verse 25, now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. You have had your chance, you lost your chance. You yielded under pressure, you lost your chance. You didn't recognize the temptation, that the pressure is temptation to make you to a crumble, to make you to yield and to collapse. No, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Number one, the temptation to compromise. Number two, the temptation to quit when the road is rough and when the time is tough. Number three, the temptation to yield under pressure. Number four, the temptation to claim immunity and act independent from God's word. The temptation to claim immunity. I'm a leader. I'm protected. The Lord appeared to me. And the Lord revealed himself to me. I'm above the law. All the other people can obey the law. But I am above the law. Great temptation. When you think you're above the law. You're above the word. 
you're above God. Temptation to claim immunity and to act independently of God. Let's look at First Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Think about that. Daughter of Pharaoh. That's in, from Egypt. Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go in to them. The Lord had said, ye shall not go in to them. But the leader, the king, claimed immunity. And he claimed independence from God's word. And there may be people like that. They don't see it as temptation. When they claim immunity, I am untouchable. And so I will do what I want to do. And I know the word of God is there. We all hear the word of God. I can act independent of God's word. I just had a temptation facing you then. A great temptation. A mighty temptation. And you're yielding to that temptation, claiming immunity. Number five, the temptation to indulge your children and abandon God's standard. The temptation to pet and pamper your children and then abandon God's standard. They may be your biological children, or they may be your children in the faith. They may be workers under you. And they may be people that look up to you. Daddy, daddy. Mommy, mommy. And because you want to keep that great name, daddy, mommy, you now fall into the temptation of indulging your children and abandoning God's standard. First Samuel chapter 2, reading from verse 22. Temptation. They didn't see it as temptation. How many people today don't see this as temptation? But this is temptation. Look at chapter, chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. There are people that use the excuse of being old, very old. And so we cannot earnestly contend for the faith as we used to do. Now we're old. I need the people to take care of me. I need the people to supply my needs. I need the people to make life easy for me. I cannot be on the battlefield honestly contending for the faith at such an old age. That's the downfall of a leader that does not know that temptation has come because of now glossing over what he should actually deal with. It says now, Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. How they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then in verse 29, Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, and honorest thy sons above me. There are people who do not know that's a great temptation. The sons are not born again. They put those sons into the ministry. The sons are not committed to the word of God. And they put those sons to keep on ministering to the congregation of the people of God. They say 
these are the leaders of tomorrow. I'm not sure the unsaved children, untaught children, uncontrollable children, sinful children are the leaders of the church of God tomorrow. I don't think that is right. I don't think that is speaking for God. Now you honor your sons above me to make yourselves part of the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now, but now, but now the Lord says, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Then, number six, the temptation to substitute one sin for another sin is solving problems. Here is a problem. We want to solve the problem. And here is a grievous sin. And we want to remove that sin. And in leadership, there are people that fall into the temptation of substituting one sin for the other. Genesis. I'm reading from chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. We're reading from verse 5. Temptation. Varied kinds of temptation. In Genesis chapter 19 verse, reading from verse 5. And he called unto the Lord. I said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. That is, they wanted to commit sodomy with them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, brethren, sodomites, I pray you, brethren, sinners, their yeah, brethren, I pray you, the ones that wanted to defile the angels that came that night, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. You can commit whatever you want to commit with them. They're my daughters. I offer them to you. And I know that you are many. And you want to take your turn and do whatever you want to do to these daughters. They've never known men. But I surrender them to you. It says, only unto these men, my visitors tonight, for thou do nothing, for therefore came they under my shadow of my roof. The shadow of my roof. There are people in trying to solve problem. This sin is not okay. That sin is not okay. And the solution they have is to offer another sin. Is to close their eyes against other sins as long as... You don't commit this other sin. Substituting one sin for another sin. Number seven, the temptation to use unqualified workers. We're leaders, we're raising up these people, and we're getting them to work for the Lord. And we're too slow in putting them there. And since they've started coming to church, Maybe their salvation is not very genuine yet, and it's not very definite yet. But you know, other churches are calling them. And when they get to those churches, they'll make them workers and leaders. Why don't we do the same? 
why don't we bribe them, tie them down with position? Great temptation, temptation. The temptation to use unqualified workers. Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. I'm reading from verse 6. Wherefore, my fury and mine anger was put forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. Therefore now does says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, wherefore commit this great evil against your souls to cut off from you man and woman, child and suckling, out of Judah to leave you none to remain in that ye provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands but in a sense unto all the gods in the land of Egypt whither ye began to dwell that ye might cut yourselves off and that ye might curse, ye might be a curse and a reproach unto all nations. What did they do? Because they used unqualified workers. That's what happened to them. Number eight, the temptation to lean on the arm of flesh and not to lean on the Holy Ghost. A leader in the church. The Lord calls us, and He calls us by the Holy Spirit. And now there are arms of flesh, and the arms of flesh tell us we're here to direct you, to guide you, to control you, and to tell you what to do. Why are you looking up to God? Why are you looking up to the Holy Spirit? Are we not experienced enough? And becomes a temptation the temptation to lean on the arm of flesh and not to lean on the holy spirit we're looking at jeremiah chapter 17. in jeremiah chapter 17 i read from verse 5 thus says the lord cause it be the man that trusteth a man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departed from the Lord. Cause it be the man that will forsake God and forsake the Holy Ghost as the guide. And now he doesn't need to pray. He doesn't need to seek the face of the Lord because those arms of flesh are there to tell him what to do. They have appointed him. And they make him to remain in office. And once he pleases them, he thinks all things are all right. And he has abandoned the guide that Christ has given to us. I pray you'll not fall to that temptation. If you are falling to that temptation, I pray you will wake up and you'll shake yourself from the dust in Jesus' name. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 8. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Ezekiah, the king of Judah. Number nine is the temptation. To fear a strong personality and forget the rapture. The temptation to fear a strong personality and forget the rapture. We're looking at First Kings chapter 19. I read from verse 2. First Kings chapter 19, verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, 
If I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Jezebel, you don't know who you are sending a message to. He is our prophet of fire. And you can just sit down and the captain will come with 50 people and say, Prophet Elijah, come down. And I'll just sit down there, relax, and say, If I am the servant of God, as you have said, Prophet of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And it happened. He doesn't know. Jezebel did not know who he was talking about. And uh, they said the man, a child had died. And the woman, the mother of the child, brought the child to Elijah and said, Why well, have you come to remind me of my sin? He said, Give me that child. And he prayed unto God, and that dead child rose up again. But Jezebel, all the same, sent the message. A strong personality. And Elijah himself had forgotten whom he was. His calling. And he didn't know that a rapture was waiting for him. And in verse 3, and when he saw, when he saw that, he arose and he went for his life. And came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and led his servant there. What a great temptation. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, into the wilderness, into the wilderness. He had no city to go to. He had no town or village to go to. The man was confused. The man was under temptation. The temptation to run, run anywhere. Elijah, where are you going? I don't really know. All I know is I'm running away from that strong personality. It's a great temptation. When you're in the ministry and God has called you and appointed you, and now there's a strong personality that says, I'll rubbish your ministry. I will destroy you. I will use all means I have available. I will run you out of town. And then you forget who you are. And like Elijah, you ran into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough. It is enough. No, Elijah, you don't decide what you have done enough in ministry. That's in the hand of God. And brother, sister, there, you don't decide when it is enough. It's God Almighty, the one that called you that will know it's enough. And whether it wasn't enough because it was after this time, the Lord led him to choose Elisha. After this time, the Lord led him to prophesy about Jehu. After this time, the chariots of fire came and took him to heaven. We know it's not enough. In temptation, when temptations confront you, you think, it's enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Ah, Elijah, you are better. None of them, your fathers, raise the dead. None of them call fire now. None of them confronted all those prophets of Baal single-handedly. You are better, but you are yielding to temptation. I pray you will not yield to temptation. I said you will not yield to temptation. The temptation to use carnal weapons. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse four. Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse four. The temptation to use carnal weapons. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's go to point number two. Vigilance against the temptations of teachers and trainers. The Lord has called us to teach His Word without fear, without favor. The Lord has called us to train, train up people, people that will take the same gospel, saving gospel, the sanctifying gospel, and the gospel that prepares people for heaven is called us to take that gospel and preach that gospel without alteration, without modification, and preach it to every creature, wherever they are. And there is the temptation of teachers and trainers. We will be vigilant. Give me a good amen. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. The temptation to teach or the temptation to corrupt the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. There's temptation to corrupt the word of God. If some people come to your church, if some people attend your church service, and you had prepared your message, and the Lord had given you what to say. Ah, I dare not say that. I need to modify a little, change a little, introduce what people want to hear. And you corrupt the word of God. You have just yielded to temptation without knowing. Number two, the temptation to teach only what people want to hear. The temptation to teach only what people want to hear. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they want you to help them scratch their itching ears. And they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, useless stories, stories that do not bring any conviction upon them. And it's that temptation for you to say only what the people want you to say. And for you to preach only what the people want you to preach. The temptation to teach only what people want to hear. Number three, the temptation to teach limited, a limited gospel. A limited gospel. Moderating the word to the level of the people. They can't hear this. They can't endure this. They cannot do restitution now. They cannot be that righteous. They won't appreciate holiness now. The temptation to teach a limited gospel. Acts chapter 18, reading from verse 25. Acts 18, verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake 
and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And you cannot claim ignorance. In the case of Apollos, he was ignorant. That's all he knew. A limited gospel. In our own case, we've gone almost from Genesis to Revelation. And we have explained everything. Expounded everything. And we will not say that we don't know the whole counsel of God. But the temptation comes to only do this. There's a village church. There's a township church. There's a location church. And these people are far from the headquarters. And they won't understand all this. This is not a city. Yes, but you are preparing them for the rapture. You are preparing them for heaven. You're preparing them for obedience to the totality of what is revealed. And you're one of the pastors that have committed themselves to earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. There's a temptation to preach a limited gospel. There's a temptation of self-righteousness without personal experience of salvation the temptation to uphold self-righteousness without the experience of personal salvation they've come in they tie their scarf they remove their jewelry by the way there are churches out there that do not emphasize salvation. They don't use jewelry too. Some of the churches even deny themselves of wearing shoes to their sanctuary. And some of the people are so limited in their dressing. They can only dress like this. That doesn't make a born again person. Look at John chapter 3. I will read him from verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so, teaching people to only have self-righteousness, take away this, take away that, and come to self dinner, don't smoke and don't drink. And they have an appearance of righteousness, but they do not have an experience of being born again. They cannot say on this particular day, at this particular time, I knelt down, or I stood up, or I did whatever, and I confessed my sins. And I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I knew from that day the peace of God entered into my heart. And then the strength of the grace of God to go and see no more, I received. And since that time, by the grace of God, I've been living the victorious life. They can't say that because they only have outward righteousness self-righteousness without being born again it's a temptation for us to teach only the external part of religion and not teach being born again number five is the temptation to be superficial in our teaching the temptation to be superficial in our teaching that the teaching, the preaching doesn't produce conviction and doesn't produce the cry from the heart. What shall I do to be saved? We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 11. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, superficially, saying, Peace, peace, when 
there is no peace. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Verse 20, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. Is there any section of the church where we have teachers teaching them, like in the children's section, are we emphasizing salvation? Are we thinking children cannot be saved? No, you can't say that. You know that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are we emphasizing salvation being born again? among the youths on the campus in the local church in the adult church or are they going to cry on the final day the harvest is past the summer is ended and we are not saved there's temptation to to teach partial truth the temptation to teach partial truth malachi Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. Malachi, chapter 2, reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have been partial in the law. If your children are doing something wrong, sinful, and it's known to people around you, and you happen to be a preacher, and the word of God you are teaching that day shows that we should warn the children and make them rise up and get saved and live the life. But now you remember, your own children have the same challenge. And you're teaching and you want to teach. You might use worldly wisdom, satanic wisdom, because of your children, not to say the truth, not to rescue the families that need to be rescued just because of your children. Maybe your wife is not living according to the standard of the word of God. She fights with other people in the market. And it's come to your hearing. Number one, you still keep that fighting wife as the women leader over that church location. Position is there forever and ever, eternal security. And now, we're teaching about the family. And we're teaching about the qualification of a pastor. His wife must be converted. And then you see that if I read this and say this, the thing will boomerang. It will come back to me. And so you gloss over that. And then you try to say there are people who are looking at the families of other people. They're not looking at their own families. And yet their families are out in, ah, my brother, don't cover up. Say what needs to be said. There are people that have their close friends, sinful, backsliding, and they know. And when the word comes, they ought to preach. They cannot do that because of their friends. Let's come close home. The people like Simon Peter. They had yielded to temptation in the past and they failed and they fell 
and everybody knows that this happened to them in the past now they have been restored like peter was restored and they had to preach the watch of god without fear and without favor and they know that this happened to them before and instead of warning the people and teaching the word of god fearlessly they gloss over some things because people may remember that i simon peter fell before that's not being sincere it's a great temptation for any teacher to teach partial truth because if they told the whole truth it will affect them you will not be like that your amen is cold today are you afraid i might strike at your temptation and so you are careful i won't say amen now i want him to finish i want him to mention all he wants to mention i say we will not be like that in jesus name number one is the temptation to corrupt the word of god number two is the temptation to teach only what the people want to hear number three is to teach a limited gospel number four is to teach self-righteousness without personal experience of salvation number five is to teach superficial teaching and number six is to teach partial truth number seven is to accommodate false teachers accommodate false teachers did you hear the other churches are opening the door for deeper life and we need to go to those churches and they're saying deeper life come come we only hope that she will not bring deeper life here no we'll bring the bible there we'll bring the word of god there the word of God is against sin, it's against evil, it's against idolatry. We're not looking for open doors, only God opens doors. If God opens the door, we go in and we preach to them. If they close the door and God allows the door to be closed, praise the Lord. We'll still keep on emphasizing the truth there's a temptation to accommodate false teachers in second corinthians chapter 11 second corinthians chapter 11 i'm reading to you from verse 13 in second corinthians 11 verse 13 for such a false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works you will not perish with false apostles we will not perish with false teachers wherever we go and whatever we do anywhere we go will stand for the lord uncompromisingly in jesus name number eight is the temptation to teach tradition rather than saving truth the temptation to teach tradition rather than saving truth. Mark chapter 7. I read from verse 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 7. How be it in vain? Do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups 
and many other things, such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well, have ye rejected the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition? Number nine, the temptation to teach for personal gain. The temptation to teach for personal gain. The preacher is hungry for friends. He wants friends. He's forgotten the lover of his soul. He wants people to love him. And the only way he can do that is to bench the truth. Is to change the truth. The fellow wants business contacts. And the only way he can keep those business contacts is to bench the truth. And he teaches. He appears to teach superficially. And you'll think he's teaching the truth. But the people who have eyes to see and ears to hear, they know this man is bending the truth. And he's doing it for personal gain. You will not be like that. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 10. Great temptation. Great temptation. In chapter 1 of Titus, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not, tell me, for filthy lucas' sake. Number 10, the temptation to keep teaching while sinning. The temptation to hold to the pulpit while they are sinning secretly. Great temptation that a person is not abiding in the truth and is not living according to the truth. But it says, I'm a preacher. And I keep on teaching, even while committing sin. Romans chapter 2, verse 20. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore that teachest another, Teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest the man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Thou that says the man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law. Through the breaking of the law, Dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The people you know, the preacher, and they know that the preacher is their sin partner. They wonder that that man is standing at the pulpit and is declaring what he calls the word of God. And he's so serious and he's so firm. And it's so clear about it. And they say, those who don't know him will say, whenever so any man like this before this man is a preacher. But the same partners there would say, how is he talking like this? After all, we know ourselves and we know what we do together in the secret. God will save us and save our church from such preachers in Jesus' name. Point number three now, victory. I have the victory. You have the victory in Jesus' name. You have the victory. The power to be victorious, the Lord will give to you. The power to stand firm in the private and the public, the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. Victory over the temptations of pastors and preachers pastors and 
preachers. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 15. In Jeremiah chapter, chapter 3 verse 15, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Amen. Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. If a pastor is not feeding the church with knowledge and understanding, the Heavenly Father has not given that pastor to that church. If a pastor is not emphasizing the truth that will feed us and make us hate sin and make us strong in the way of the Lord, if a pastor is not doing that in any of our pulpits, the Father in heaven has not given us such a pastor. He appointed himself. Some other people appointed him. And he placed him there. And he assured, they assured him, who appointed you, nobody can remove you. If anybody tries to remove you, leave that in our hands. We who appointed you, and we want you to stay there, corrupting the church, will see to it. But every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. Look at verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Well, let's understand that those pastors face temptations. Those preachers face temptation. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. And he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Lord will give all our pastors and preachers Victory in Jesus' name. What are the temptations of the pastors and the preachers? Number one, the temptation of preaching faith and walking by sight. The temptation of preaching faith on the pulpit. Then in their personal lives, they are walking by sight. Second Corinthians Chapter 5, I read from verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. The temptation of preaching faith in their personal life, they walk by sight. In their families, they walk by sight. In their plans, they walk by sight. In wanting to get something, I had to get something in the church or to get something in the community, they walk by sight. They preach faith and they walk by sight. Number two, the temptation to fear and to please men. The temptation to fear and to please men is like some ropes are tied to their legs. And there are people that pull them here, pull them here. They do not have a conscience of their own, a mind of their own, a decision of their own. They do not have the backbone to stand for the truth because they have the fear of man and they please men. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, 
If I fear men and please them, I should not be the servant of Christ. Number three, the temptation of not practicing what we learn and what we teach. The temptation of not practicing. You leave the doctrine in the church. You leave the message on the pulpit where you preach it. And then you cannot carry it out by yourself. And next week you come back again and you drop another message on the pulpit. But we are waiting for you. Do it. Obey it. Practice it. Live by what you teach. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 4. Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and laid them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You'll not be a Pharisee. I will not be a Pharisee. In Jesus' name. The temptation of magnifying men and minimizing God. The temptation of magnifying men and minimizing God. There are the act when they see the men that put them on the run. But they don't run like that when God has charged them, commanded them, challenged them. They fear men, they don't fear God. The temptation of magnifying men and minimizing God. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 12. We're reading from verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he has killed, has power. To cast into hell, yea, I say unto you, fear him. You will not die before your time. There is nothing to fear. If God has called you, he will send his angels to protect you. Are you not, are not five sparrows sold for two fathers? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even your very ears, the very ears of your head, are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Say amen to the words of Jesus. Number six, or number five, the temptation of giving much attention to temporal things and to little attention to eternal things. The temptation of giving too much attention to temporal things and not giving enough attention to eternal things. Second Corinthians chapter 4. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, I read from verse 16. In verse 16, for which cause we think not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us if I'm more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, temporal, but at the things which are not seen, eternal. For the things which are seen are temporal, 
For the things which are not seen are eternal. The temptation of running away from wolves. The temptation of running away from wolves. The Lord already told us that He's sending us out to preach His word among wolves. And so there's no point running away. He told us ahead of time the wolves are there in spite of them, despite the wolves who are not running away will preach the word of God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly the ravening wolves. Inwardly the ravening wolves. Luke chapter 10 In Luke chapter 10 Reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 10, from verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 also, other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs, tell me, among wolves. That's what he has sent us to do. We're going to preach the gospel everywhere. No wolf will threaten us. No wolf will intimidate us. If you don't say amen, they will intimidate you. And they will not crush any of us in Jesus' name. There's a temptation of forgetting the importance of getting sinners saved. The temptation to forget the importance of getting sinners saved. If we forget getting sinners saved, we forget a ministry, and then we labor in vain. And when we get to the other side, there's nobody to show for your ministry. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Number eight, the temptation of compromising holiness for growth. The temptation of compromising holiness for growth. We want to grow, we want to grow, we want to grow. Put this in place and put that in place. And we'll stop preaching holiness so that we can grow. If we teach holiness, maybe some of the people will not stay. Well, if you don't teach holiness, some people might stay. But those are wishy washy people. Those are unbelieving people. Those are people that don't have any plan of getting to heaven. Preach the word. And those who want to get to heaven will stay. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no member shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no minister shall see the Lord. Then number nine is the temptation of substituting the Holy Ghost baptism with human skill. Human skill. 
and uh, there are preachers who do not bother about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. They don't bother about being immersed, empowered, endued by the Holy Ghost. After all, they have human skill. And they say human skill will do the work of the kingdom perfectly and effectively. First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. That your face should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 12, now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Number 10, the temptation of not preparing adequately to feed the flock. You have to preach. But you are busy here and there. And you are not ready. You are not prepared. And you are still talking outside with people. And then as the time comes to preach, you rush in. And you take your Bible. Somebody has written the outline. I will take that written outline and we'll read the verses and we'll read the notes that are written there. But you're not prepared. You're not serving God with all your heart. You're not giving everything you ought to give. We ought to give everything that we need to give and not fall into the temptation of not preparing adequately to feed the flock of God. We're looking at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. The Lord has revealed to us the peculiar temptations of leaders and laborers, the peculiar temptations of teachers and trainers, the peculiar temptations of pastors and preachers, and the Lord will give us victory over every temptation that comes our way in Jesus' name you'll be an overcomer on the pulpit an overcomer in your home an overcomer in the marketplace an overcomer and great will be your reward in jesus name first corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 but thanks be to god which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ is willing to energize you tonight, is willing to empower you tonight, is willing to strengthen your backbone tonight. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, amen, unmovable, amen. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your labor will not be in vain. You'll be an overcomer. You'll be more than a conqueror. What are you? Overcomer. More than a conqueror. All these temptations and any other temptation, you will overcome. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Open your mouth and really pray, really pray, really pray. Peter did not pray when Jesus told him to pray. He paid for it. Pray and the Lord will give you continual victory.